Ready to go. Okay. So this is the database session. Uh, if you're wondering what you're going to be listening to, um, and we can start right away with the first speaker, uh, Raheem Altawi, who's going to talk about Mesh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Reham did not uh, come. Uh, uh, he was my first postal and joined the University of Victoria recently. So I'm Guang Gong. Uh, today I will talk about the mesh of supply chain solution with locally private blockchain transactions. Okay, so. I think I just checked that it's working. Did you plug something in? Huh? Did you plug something in? Yeah, Is I already put it on. on. Yeah. But I just checked. Well, if it's not working, <laughs> not maybe you the can working. Use that. Yeah. So, because the talk is 17 minutes, so I will walk you through about the first, uh, what's the problem we face when we're working on the RFID supply chain uh, management problem. Then I will show you uh, the blockchain-based solution for supply chain management, what's our known things. Then I will show you our new work. Uh, and uh, first I introduce you the security architecture and the protocols. Uh, then those uh, uh, architecture provide uh, those uh, properties. We can provide uh, the flexible uh, privacy and the uh, transaction confidentiality. And uh, finally, I will show you our proof of concept uh, implemented through the Ethereum. And uh, finally, give some remarks and uh, the future works. So it's very strange. It's, it's, I, Okay, so this is uh, RFID systems. So usually we have different uh, tags. And uh, those tags can be classified into three classes. So one is a passive tag. So basically it's, uh, your tag is powered up by radio, uh, reader's signal. And also communication also powered up by uh, read, uh, reader's signal. And the semi-passive tag is uh, the only uh, communication part powered up by the reader's signal. Uh, active attack is more like a sensor, so that I won't, uh, uh, I won't use, basically. So here, uh, basically, it has two classes. One is working on the 13.56 megahertz, and the reading distance is about uh, one meter. And the second class is uh, uh, operated on the uh, 866 megahertz to 915. And the reading distance is much greater. So this is usually in the supply chain. But the two types uh, are used in the supply chain. So what's the problem here? So problem currently all of those uh, like uh, supply chain companies they have their bookkeeping so similar like uh, banking systems okay so but what do they do you you think about uh, this is uh, like the salmon farmer so then when then they may target the organic salmon or just general right okay so then you have the uh, RFID tag attached in each of those salmon then you then you go through all of those uh, need maybe transportations, uh, warehousing, and the distribution centers, and uh, finally you go to the return, uh, retainer stores, and uh, those uh, third-party transmission uh, transportation companies. Uh, then this is maybe multi-phases. Okay, so each stage, the information, like the uh, inventory information, timing, location, so those they were uploaded to, we hope, blockchain. But right now, of course, not. Uh -huh. So the, the problem is, because this is the different stakeholders. So when, they, when those individual organizations uh, stored their own information, there is no guarantee on the integrity of committed uh, information and their updates when the ownership is uh, changed. So this is a non-standing problem in RFID uh, security. Uh, 
So now, because of the blockchain suddenly catch people's eyes, uh, so then we we were thinking possibly we can we can maybe it's uh, I don't know this is very weird. I I I tested it before I gave a talk. It worked fine. Then I can control, but right now. Uh -huh. Backwards arrows to go between the slides. Yeah. So can I just uh, so I go to the uh, where I can go the full screen. Uh, can you the, the, these? Oh, this is working now. Uh -huh, because the, some guys uh, used my uh, connector child. Okay, so when the blockchain came in the site, uh, especially in like uh, last year, those transportation companies, they set up an association, try to use blockchain technology. Of course, uh, the blockchain is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer legal system, and uh, uh, also they can provide a trusted consensus uh, computation and the immutable data between untrusted uh, identities. Okay, so currently anonymous, for example, Bitcoin provided by the pseudonyms, and the Monero, those provided by the, uh, like the ring signatures. But how about the, like the sender's privacy, receivers, and the transaction? Those privacy can be guaranteed also efficiently. If you don't care about the efficiency, of course, you can do the zero knowledge proof, then you can use very advanced uh, crypto. Okay, so this is, uh, at, but at least uh, immutable, those properties, then we can use. Okay, so then how to apply this uh, blockchain to supply chain management? Then we were thinking most likely the property is immutable ability. But how we can apply uh, to the uh, supply chain? The reason is we need also not just the transaction privacy, we also need accountability. Okay, so at the very beginning, we think these two concepts is a little bit controversial. But, but however, what we solution we give is locally privacy. Basically, not a phony. Okay, so here, because in order to save space, so I define my transaction privacy. It uh, contains uh, two properties. First is anonymity of participating entities. So basically, it's standards privacy plus confidentiality of transaction information. So this is what uh, uh, I call the transaction uh, privacy. Okay, so are there known solutions? Yes, IBM, they created their hyponicia fabrics. Also, they signed the contract with Walmart. I, I think anyone from North America knows <laughs> Walmart. Uh, so they, uh, they, they have that uh, uh, food trust supply chain management. However, Fabric is a private permissioned blockchain. Only certified members can, can transact, maintain, and update the blockchain. So that's the first thing. We, our goal want to use um, permissionless, like the public blockchain. Uh -huh. uh, also, confidential entities. Uh, so they achieved this by creating the many, many of those local uh, blockchains, they call the channels. Okay, uh, however, this is uh, raising the uh, issues like the scalability, also possibility for a covert channel for leakage. So this is not studied well. And also cost. So if that's uh, uh, any company maybe medium-sized company even, they want to subscribe, then this is the cost from the 38,000 to 17,000. So this is US dollar per month, just membership fee, not the, uh, not the space you store your data, your information, just the membership fee. Okay, so that's, uh, so our goal, our goal is uh, 
can we use in public blockchain to provide some solutions to supply chain management? This is our goal. Okay, so because we set up this goal, then the problem is how we can solve the problem on transaction privacy and the accountability in the blockchain. So because the supply chain is block by block, so this concept just fit blockchain nicely. Okay, so those are third party logistic companies. So each of them, when they hand it to another party, this is what we call the ownership transfer. Okay, so how we guarantee this? Then those, uh, if that's blockchain block, uh, so they are authenticated history. Okay, so this is uh, uh, what the goal we, we try to achieve. Okay, so well, of course, uh, uh, we have a solution because we set up the goal, then we come out with the solution, we call it our system mesh. Okay, so our system basically is a blockchain based solution for supply chain management. Then we can provide the accountability, privacy of transaction and public permissionless blockchains. So how we provide this, we create the something we, we call the Basically, it's uh, we using the known crypto tools, but we combine them together. We create a membership proof system. This membership proof system can have the property is verifiable encryption. Okay, so then we proved they have the two properties. One is proxable anonymity. Uh, so this is means uh, if your anonymity need to be revoked, you can. Okay, otherwise, uh, uh, anonymity is guaranteed. And the second property is forward secrecy. So oh, basically, it's only current uh, data owner can update the status on the blockchain. And he also can see the previous one. And the previous owner cannot see now after he hand out to the next owner. Okay, so how we can achieve this? Then this is back to RFID system. Okay, so this is our architecture. Basically, we need, uh, this is our supply chain contract. So here I just write the one RFID system, but you, you have enough of those. Okay, so then we group those owners, like the Walmart, like in my area, Ontario. Ontario maybe has more than 100 Walmarts, so we, classify them according to geographical areas. So those are called the owner uh, group. Okay, so then we create the app uh, on the uh, owner group, they can, they can talk with the blockchain. And also we create the server, we call the mesh server. So because the blockchain, it, they cannot uh, directly update next to do the authentication, those things. So we need to create another contract on the blockchain. So this CM blockchain, uh, contra uh, the mesh contract basically is a representative of a mesh server. Okay, for the mesh server, then we also divided into the two functionalities. One is authorization manager, second is revocation manager, okay. So then, then this part will be the RFID systems. So reader get the data from the tag and upload it to the blockchain. Okay, so this is our uh, system uh, architecture. And of course, the first, uh, that uh, any participant, uh, they need uh, to do the registration with the mesh servers. So first they create their uh, wallet account and uh, then they have their ID, ID basically their public key. So, they are, but uh, however, in the blockchain we know your public key does not need a certificate. However, in order to do the revocation, we need. So they need to get a certificate before they use the system. Okay, so they registered with the uh, mesh server and the mesh server will put uh, the entire ID ID list, so the group of the participant into the mesh contract. So mesh contract, we are talking with the supply chain directly. So later on they can do the verification. Okay, so we look at how to do the authorization. So basically when the uh, owner uh, uh, wanted to upload some information or wanted to update some information, they will send the account list. 
So a continuist is already scheduled who is the next owner and uh, its entire chain's owner. And also each owner is a group, not just individual. And also it's the chain. Okay. Then also, uh, then also provide, the, so the, the one who upload the information or updating information, he will encrypt his identity by mesh server's public key, so we call it this is C. Then we provide the proof this is, ciphertext is indeed the uh, ciphertext of the one who uploaded the information. So this is a, a proof system pi ID. Okay, so that's a supply chain contract in order to accept this is valid uh, updating, he will contact the mesh contract. So mesh contract check whether uh, this, uh, uh, this is within the account list they uploaded before and the reply uh, yes or no. So here I still put some line. The reason is basically mesh contract is representative of mesh server. So they are basically one entity, just different functionalities. One, uh, okay, uh, one is on the, uh, live on the blockchain. And this is revocation, so I will skip that. Okay, so for the underlying cryptography, basically we need using zero knowledge proof as this is conducted in the literature. Okay, so this is what we did, how we generated the proof. So basically this is ID that we encrypted by match server's public key. Then we proof the proof, which show this is indeed, uh, this ciphertext is this guy's uh, ciphertext. Then we digital sign, then this is uh, similar as the blockchain. However, we sign the ciphertext instead of plain text. So that's why we provide the uh, confidentiality of the transaction. Okay, so this is the, how we generate the uh, proof system. And um, so then we look at the RFID site. So this is we targeted uh, because it's the uh, supply chain. They using two type of the uh, tag. One is EPC tag, another is the NFC tag. So this is their power consumption is very low. So the reason I want this is because we assume attacker cannot even drop the channel from tag to reader. So you, this is a very, uh, you know, a strong condition here, or you could think it's very weak security model here. So then this is the authentication. So it's the general uh, challenge response uh, authentication. However, when the new owner come and uh, he send the request, so he will generate the new key by one way keychain. And uh, so this is the link because this is tagged to the reader. We assume this link, uh, if dropper cannot uh, do the attack. So that is a very strong uh, condition. Okay, so that's uh, we implemented. And uh, according to the actual uh, supply chain stakeholders, uh, then so this is what we look at. However, uh, we did the comparison, so ours, so you can look at our, I will skip this, our is the most efficient. However, this is what we, maximum either room can process 20 transactions. So oh, then um, those cost is according to the uh, de uh, December 2018, so basically not practical. Right? Because usually for the supply chain, the throughput is much higher than this. However, this is the user room can process. Okay, so oh, this is what uh, we did. Okay, and uh, then uh, the problem is limitation. Basically, the real world uh, problem is that you, ha you basically finally you trust owner put true information. Right, how you detect if those cloned tag, they upload the fake information. This is we haven't touched yet. Also, our mesh authentication server is a centralized point now. 
So you say you debating, uh, you want blockchain web is decentralized. You also want to secure, then you also want scalability or support. So we cannot. Then we we make a mesh server is centralized. Also, R RFD technique, I mentioned to you that the uplink, uh, upload the channel, we assume you cannot eavesdrop. This is a uh, uh, very uh, strong condition. However, currently it is because their power consumption is so low, so you cannot uh, uh, eavesdrop. Okay, I, I think I'm on time, right? Okay, good, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we can take a question uh, while the next speaker sets up so we don't bleed into the next speaker's time. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, um, lots of existing uh, anonymous, oh, Yeah. L lots of existing anonymous blockchain systems are not really anonymous if you actually look at them from a non-theoretical perspective, but just looking at the number of participants on the network and what they do. Right, so there's lots of attacks on, uh, you know, Monero and uh, Zero, with Zcash, etc. Uh, yeah. Have you considered the, this type of attack in your uh, in your work and uh, sort of what is the minimum number of participants needed and what is the behavior needed to actually have sort of real privacy properties and not just uh, you know theoretical ones? Uh, yes, we uh, we look at those uh, like the zero cache is using the uh, zk stock as the proof or zero knowledge proof. So they they need like set up the common reference strings, uh, which is uh, very hard to implement because zero cache they said they hard coded. Right, so uh, we look at those, but uh, in this uh, work we did not, uh, uh, you know, mention those. But we already looked. Okay, thank you. But it's very interesting because right now I, I believe many companies are, are very interested. For example, because this is supply chain, but you can directly adopt it to the IoT when you put a tag on your any object, then you get another system. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, because there's a lot of grad students in the audience. Okay, I have a question. Yes, I have a question. <laughs> but you need the microphone. Oh. I need the microphone. I'll start with that. You have a microphone for you. It's a for you. Uh, just because there's a lot of grad students in the audience, yeah. you mentioned a lot of companies are interested, but uh, the truth is, is slightly different, right? I mean, Forbes uh, just recently wrote an article, 93% of all the blockchain B2B projects have failed, uh, and they're estimating vir virtually all the projects to fail. Uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, the same thing with the actual, but they're talking about B2B and supply chain, yeah. but there's also uh, coins and so on are in deep, deep trouble these days. So you think this is a topic to, to keep working on for the long term, given that reality for the past 10 plus years has shown that there's almost no applications of this in real life because the main problems are not the, block, not the technology, but rather changing structural and uh, enterprise level oh, things the that business are difficult to change model. with business yeah. models. Yes, I, I believe because so. Because students here will start working on this for yeah. years. Yeah, I believe so because uh, like uh, we use the uh, Ethereum as our test bed, right? Mm -hmm. Currently it has three companies, uh, they deal with Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. So one is IFTW located in Hong Kong and another is uh, IFTA uh, which is a German company. And the third one is a third company called the LFTEX. So each of those uh, uh, companies, they're using different consensus protocol. Right, they have no customers. So uh, have currently, no customers. yes, but those yeah, are brand, brand new companies. Yeah. yeah, those are brand new companies only started yeah, last year. They when they run out of virtual capital. Uh, uh, I mean, this is the fact, right? If you look but at you, you, see, you can think about the bubble of the, uh, of the internet 25 years ago. Yeah, only few surviving. Those surviving will be star, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Why do you transfer the microphone? Yeah, sure. Okay. So my name is Goss, and today I'll be presenting on breach resistant structured encryption. This is a work done by uh, uh, done at the Encrypted Systems Lab at Brown with Seni Kamara and Tariq Motaz. Um, so yeah, so 
In today's world, a huge amount of data is stored and processed on databases in the cloud. This data includes our sensitive, uh, sensitive health records, our secret and not so secret communications, our shopping activity, etc. Uh, and unfortunately for us, even if we trust the server hosting the data, uh, uh, we do not. Uh, these databases are very unprotected from external adversaries that can break into the uh, server and steal it. Uh, and in recent past, as many of you might be aware, there have been a constant occurrence of data breaches. And this is happening to governments, small, uh, small businesses, large businesses, uh, big organizations, etc. The Equifax one alone affected 143 million Americans. And the need to uh, keep this data safe from these attackers is now more urgent than ever. So, like I said, uh, data is stored in the cloud, in databases, and now there are roughly two ways in which this data can be stolen. One, the adversary compromises the applications and then queries the data. Two, the advers adversary breaks into the da uh, database and steals, uh, uh, breaks into the server and steals the database. And we are more concerned with option number two here. So c the question becomes, can we encrypt databases even in use? And the, what we want here essentially is to be able to encrypt the database in, uh, in such a way that it can be privately queried in use? Uh, and the answer is yes, we can. And we have known that for quite some time now. But there's an efficiency trade-off. Uh, there's a trade-off between efficiency, functionality, and privacy here. Uh, for example, if you want really efficient schemes, you'll have to sacrifice on privacy and leak more to the server, and so on and so forth. So one of the bi bi building blocks for, uh, for, data, uh, for encrypted databases is called Structure Encryption, or STE, in short, which is a way for us to privately encrypt data structures. And for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on STEs. So let's say you have a client that has some sensitive data in a data structure, and, it, uh, and there's a server uh, which you do not trust. And so the client will have a set of protocol which takes in a security parameter, the data structure, and outputs a secret key K and an encrypted data structure. It will then send this uh, encrypted data structure to the server. At this point, the, uh, the server, it, some information might be revealed to the server, like the size of the data, uh, data, uh, the encrypted data structure. And this is captured by a uh, set up a leakage function called LS. Now, the, the cl client want, might want to, pri obviously, might want to privately query the, uh, the, data, uh, data, the encrypted data structure. And for that, it has a token algorithm, which takes in that secret key it produced. It takes in the query, it produces a token. The purpose of this token here is to hide the plain text underlying query from the server. The server takes this token and the encrypted data structure and produces an answer using the query algorithm. The answer then goes to the client. Now, at this point, the server might be able to learn something from the token it just saw from the query protocol, like whether the search was repeated, or what was the size of the result set, and so on and so forth. And this is captured by another uh, function called the uh, le query leakage function, or LQ. Now, in the same way, you can have an update token function that takes in the update and produces an update token. I'm not showing the lines here. Uh, and then, the, uh, in the same way, the server has an update algorithm that updates the encrypted data structure. And likewise, you have an update leakage function that captures that leakage. Now, knowing all this, knowing that we can encrypt data structures, uh, such as dictionaries or multi-maps, and produce encrypted multi-maps, encrypted dictionaries, we uh, a little bit of background on this. When you have an encrypted multi-map, you can think of it as an encrypted inverted index, which is a very powerful search primitive and which has served as a basic building block for many single search keyword SSE schemes. Encrypted multimaps are also building blocks for encrypted NoSQL databases, encrypted graph databases, encrypted relational databases. Now, a little bit of refresher on the dictionaries and multimaps. Dictionaries map label to values, like W1 here is a label is mapped to ID1, W2 is mapped to ID3, and so on. Multimaps, on the other hand, are ma map labels to multiple values or tuples. Multimaps can be thought of as a generalization of dictionaries. Now, uh, in the, uh, the structure encryption slide that I had, we can now instantiate our data structure with multimaps and encrypt data structure with encrypted multimap. And notice that all the red changes on the screen here. I've replaced e uh, EDS and <coughs> DS with MM and EMMs. Right. So now I'll just state the adaptive security, uh, what adaptive security means in the context of STE. The standard notion of a security for STE guarantees that the setup algorithm and the encrypted structure reveals no information about the underlying structure beyond LS. 
the query algorithm reveals no information about the structure in the queries beyond LQ. The update algorithm reveals no information about the structure and the updates beyond LU. If this holds for adaptively chosen operations, then the scheme is said to be adaptively secure. Right. A, a security property of recent interest for, uh, has been for our privacy. And formally, it states that updates cannot be correlated to previous queries. Uh, for instance, if you search for, let's say, a keyword W, and then you update for W, the server at this point should not be able to learn that these two updates are for the same operation. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, these, two, these two operations are for the same keyword. And uh, formally, in BOSS 16, it was defined as update leakage revealing at most the number of updates and nothing more. So, Along with the standard persistent adversary, which, is this, which can be thought of as a server itself, we are also interested in a snapshot uh, uh, adversary in this work. So let me just quickly uh, tell you the difference between the two. Now, a persistent adversary can be treated as, uh, as the server itself, and it holds your EMM. If you send it a token, it can see the token. It can send you back your response, it can see the response. You can send it uh, more tokens, it can see them, it can see the answers, you can send it update tokens, it, it'll see that update token, respectively. Now, a snapshot version, on the other hand, is, uh, is, not, uh, is outside of the cloud, let's say. And let's call EMM, uh, our initial EMM, EMM0. The snapshot version can grab a snapshot of this EMM0. Now, if you send a token, uh, the, the snapshot adversary will not see it. You get an answer back, like before. The, now, the, uh, now, the, now your encrypted multimap can update because of the underlying query, depending on your underlying scheme. Uh, sorry, uh, because of the query, depending on your underlying scheme, because it might change the structure in some way. The, the snapshot adversary can then grab a snapshot of this. Like, you can send an update token which will change, update your encrypted multimap to EMM2, the snapshot adversary can grab a snapshot of this. And again, uh, EMM3, the snapshot adversary can grab a snapshot of this. Right, so now, snapshot adversary is, a, uh, is intuitively a very weak adversary compared to a persistent adversary, right? So does that mean that persistent security implies snapshot security? And more precisely, the snapshot leakage versus a snapshot adversary equals setup leakage versus a persistent adversary? And the answer is yes, but if only if the data structure is static, but no if it's dynamic. Because queries and updates can change EMMs in such a way that they reveal more to a snapshot adversary than, than it, they should. Therefore, snapshot security is not equal to persistent security. So our main contributions in this work is, has been, uh, have been that you formalize snapshot security. Uh, a similar notion called offline security uh, w was defined in Liu and Wu paper in 2016, but it was in the domain of order revealing encryption and uh, range queries. We introduced the notion of breach resistance, which I'll define later. We, uh, we have side results stating that breach resistance implies a variant of, a weak variant of history independence and right only obliviousness. Um, we have a scheme called DLS, which is both for private against a persistent adversary and breach resistant against a snapshot adversary. In other words, a dual secure scheme. We have an offline rebuild protocol. We have a, another scheme called DLST, which is also dual secure, but it has a deamortized rebuild protocol. And we have an open source implementation for our schemes. Now, I will, I will, uh, I'm going. Um, so now, let's look, uh, look at the newer trade-offs resulting from our work. So what's the persistent adversary? Uh, your x-axis uh, shows leakage and your y-axis shows efficiency. Um, schemes, like, uh, schemes that are ORM-based and FHE-based are uh, leak very little, but they're also not uh, very efficient. Schemes uh, which are PPE-based, which is pro uh, pri uh, uh, property preserving encryption based, they leak a lot, but they're also efficient. STE-based schemes are a very good trade-off between leakage and efficiency. Ideally, we want to get here. What's the snapshot adversary? We see that our scheme DLS is almost here where we want it to be, which is it leaks very little and it ha it's uh, it's very efficient. 
So uh, now let's look at a formulation of snapshot security. We have a real, uh, we have a real experiment and an ideal experiment. In the real experiment, the ad adversary sends a uh, sends a multimap zero uh, to the challenger. The challenger then uses set up uh, protocol to and outputs an EMM zero to the adversary. The adversary then sends a query. The uh, the 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 challenger will use the to a token algorithm, produce a token, apply it to the EMM zero, and output an EMM one back to the adversary. Likewise, the adversary will send an update. The the client will send an uh, apply that update and send back a um, uh, EMM2. Now, this can go on, and an adversary chooses the these operations adaptively. Uh, uh, in the ideal experiment, the adversary sends a multimap uh, to a simulator. The simulator does not get the multimap, rather, it gets a snapshot leakage of the multimap. The snapshot leakage can be thought of as what the snapshot adversary learns at setup uh, by taking a snapshot of the structure at setup. Using that the leakage, it simulates EMM0, it sends it back to the adversary. The adversary then sends a query. But the simulator only receives a snapshot leakage of the query, which can be thought of as a snapshot taken at time of query by a snapshot adversary. A leakage learned from that snapshot. The, the simulator then simulates the query token, applies it, and sends back EMM1. Likewise, you can get uh, you'll send update. It will get the snapshot leakage of that operation, apply the uh, simulated update, send back the simulated EMM2. The main, and this can also go on, and an adversary chooses the operation adaptively. So the main idea here is that the adversary should not be able to distinguish between a real experiment and an ideal experiment. OK, so breach resistant. We define breach resistant as snapshot uh, leakage revealing at most the size of the current structure. That's it. So breach resistance is a very important property, because let's say you have an adversary that breaks into the server and takes a snapshot after every operation. Uh, if you leak things like which values were touched, between snapshots or with which operations, uh, uh, sorry, if you leak things like which values are desperate operations, the adversary might be able to you know, infer the nature of your operations or whether you deleted something and things like that. So, the, so now we'll focus on designing uh, dual secure EMMs, basically, breach resistant and fault private. Uh, so there are many challenges that came up during this process. We want essentially to keep a dynamic encrypted multimap breach resistant, forward private, and efficient at the same time. All, that, all of that by using only efficient symmetric key primitives and not storing deleted entries for too long, unlike previous schemes. Right? So, RDS construction. Sorry. So, let's uh, get into this. And, uh, and of, uh, over the course of the following slides, I'll give a very high level idea because of lack of time. Uh, like most schemes in literature, our scheme is also based on the Pi dynamic scheme by Cash et al. in 2014. And I'll give you a quick refresher over this. Uh, so you have a multimap and a security parameter, and you put it inside the setup algorithm. And, you, and what you get output, output is a multimap holding your encrypted identifiers and a secret key K. Right? Now let's look at these two particular values. Here, W3 is mapped to identifier 2 and identifier 4. Here, you have a pseudo-random valuation at counter 1, and it's mapped to the encrypted uh, encryption of ID2. This pseudo-random uh, pseudo function is keyed by uh, something donated by KW3, which is basically another pseudo-random uh, pseudo function evaluation of W3 keyed by the, your secret key K, which is this key. Right? Now, uh, and for ID4 encryption, your label is evaluated at, uh, label is a pseudo-random function evaluated at counter 2. Now, let's say you want to add something. Let's add another, uh, another identifier for, uh, for uh, keyword 3. This will be evaluated at counter 3. And you send it to the server, this label and value. And the server will simply put it inside the multimap. Let's say you want to delete something. You now would evaluate at counter 4, because it's the fourth, uh, fourth uh, thing for W3. And the server will get this and simply put it inside. Notice the red color here. The red color here means that the identifier is encrypted along with the delete tag. Now, if you want to search for this, you'll send KW3 to the server. The server will use, uh, will, uh, use the pseudo runner function and uh, keyed at this KW3 and evaluate it 1, 2, 3, and 4, get the results, send it back to you. You will then decrypt them and prune them, remove the deleted entries. So in our construction, think of two multimaps. One, a static EMM, and one is uh, EMM for updates. Uh, yeah. 
So notice here that uh, it's not just KW1 now. It's KW1 appended by a 0. I'll talk about it later. It, it's done uh, to, min to get for privacy because the scheme that I just talked about in cache wasn't for private. But um, uh, I will not talk about the for privacy aspect of it uh, because of lack of time. To search for WI, you, sim you send an old token, which is KWI appended by zero, which is basically a pseudo random function key to the secret key, evaluated at WI appended by zero. And you send an, uh, and, uh, uh, and this old token, sorry. And this old token will basically retrieve values from the static EMM. And you have a new token, which are basically pseudo random evaluations from one to N, where N is the total updates. And and this this is keyed at KWI appended by one, which is basically pseudo evaluations keyed by the secret key K evaluated at WI appended by one. So most dynamic schemes, EMM construction handles the delete very naively. They have query complexity, which has this factor in them: actual result size plus del zero W, which is delete since you instantiated your EMM. Uh, so basically, they treat delete like ads. So the storage complexity also has this factor in it. So the, uh, so the problem is that data structure keeps getting bigger and bigger because of deletes, and client needs to prune more and more. So hence, we have a rebuild operation in our scheme, which is executed throughout the lifetime of the encrypted structure. It removes or prunes the deleted pairs. And the question is, can't a client simply after search send back a pruned list? to the server to basically update. But no, we, we can't do that, because that will leak the result set to a snapshot adversary, because a snapshot adversary can take a snapshot before and after a query, and it can see exactly what the client sent back and what was updated, and will know the result set of the query. So approach number one for rebuilding. Client queries for each keyword and recovers encrypted IDs, removes the deleted IDs, reinserts the new encrypted keywords and IDs but there's a leakage. It leaks new information to persistent adversary, query leakage of unsearched for keywords. This, the persistent adversary doesn't need to see query leakage of unsearched for keywords. Uh, so you have an approach number two, where we keep track of these unsearched for, unsearched for uh, labels during the rebuild op between the rebuild operations. And we use approach number one for search for labels, because the server already knows the result set for those. And for unsearched for labels, we Sample pairs uniformly at random, re-encrypt and reinsert them. But there's a problem. Rebuild is an offline process. You have to stop everything, rebuild the structure, all right? Uh, and we can't allow snapshots during it because the snapshot reversal can learn things by client sending back conforged stuff. Uh, so we have a variant with deamortized rebuild, which is executed during the updates, but it requires a stash at client. And, but the full details for that are in the paper. So we have implementation which is of, uh, 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 of a version with offline rebuild, a version with deamortized rebuild. It's about 1,000 lines of code in Java. It's in the Clusion Encrypt Research Library that's available online. Uh, the experiment set was Amazon EC2 C38X large instance. We had 32 core CPU and 60 GB of RAM. We, uh, we used the Wikipedia data set with 26.5 GBs in size and about 2.5 million files. Experiments are done in memory. So set in time, the x-axis is the number of label value pairs. The y-axis are time in minutes. And it took uh, almost 13 minutes to set up an EMM with almost 85 million pairs. Uh, uh, about EMM and client state sizes, uh, the, si um, uh, the y-axis is the size in gigabytes. The x-axis is the number of uh, available pairs. Uh, Size of EMM is 85 million pairs and almost 11 GB. And size of client state for 85 million pairs is almost uh, 200 MB. Uh, query time, uh, different uh, uh, three lines for different result set sizes. Uh, time in milliseconds is on, uh, time in microseconds is on the y-axis. Query time per pair is under one microsecond. And size of EMM does not seem to have any effect. Update time, we have, uh, these different lines are for different parameters for the deamortized rebuild. I didn't go into it, it's in the full paper. Uh, time in milliseconds of the y-axis, and update time per uh, pair is around 100 milliseconds, and this is large, because, mostly because of the rebuild process that takes, takes during updates. 
uh, in the deamortized version. So wrapping up, we formalized the notion of temperature security for STE. We introduced the notion of breach resistant and dual security, which is very important to structure encryption. We introduced two new efficient and dual secure schemes, DLS and DLST, which has a reamortized rebuild. We have an open source implementation available on inclusion and then various experiments to determine practicality. Proof of security and side results of further interest are available in our paper. Thank you. All right, we're getting right up against the 20 minutes, so let's have the next speaker set up. That is, set your laptop up, but you have to keep your microphone so they can hear your response. Yeah. Okay, Radu, I'll bring over the mic. Hi. Um, so you guys seem to have reinvented all the stuff that the guys have done in ORAM for the past 20, 25 years, and all the stuff that has been done with uh, write-only ORAMs for plausible deniability and all this stuff. So I'm wondering, because you have this multi-snapshot story, so I'm wondering, how, what's the relationship within this and all that work that has been done in, in the past 30 years in ORAM? Uh, what particular, uh, like... Um, well, your adversary is an observer from the outside that yeah. takes multi multiple snapshots. Yeah. This problem is ex the identical problem that appears in plausible ability, hoister independence, uh, no. and many okay. ORAM papers okay. for the past 25 so years. This setting, the adversary setting is a little different. We are concerned about the persistent adversary who can see the access pattern, like in ORAM, where you hide the access pattern, right? The solution is only secure. First of all, the solution, I, I didn't understand, to be honest. I, I'm okay. not as smart. But, uh, but the solution seems to be just preventing against the snapshot adversary, not the persistent adversary. No, it is secure against the persistent adversary. And it has a standard ST leakage profile that all the ST schemes have. That's the thing here. It's a dual secure system. Oh, I can see. So you're leaking a lot of info. That's what you're yeah, saying. You're leaking yeah, system. I am. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm leaking more than uh, so, like an ORAM. You know, if I, if I was using an ORAM, I would leak less to a person adversary, obviously. I would not leak the access pattern. Access pattern is being leaked here, but that's because it's an STE scheme, which uh, it's secure against uh, with a certain leakage profile against the persistent. And it's also secure against snapshot adversary, uh, breach resistant against snapshot adversary. That means it has snapshot leakage of just the size of the current structure, and that's it. Right, so you will get much better numbers from, from existing results in ORAM and plausible reliability by a factor of 100. No, that's why I'm no but. Uh, You're leaking more, and uh, the performance is 100 M. Uh, no, but perf uh, the performance is in Java. Uh, the, the code we've written in Java, the most the ORAM stuff, it's like written in C++ and everything. So I'm pretty sure uh, it's very comparable there at that term. Okay. It, uh, yeah. It'll be more efficient in ORAM. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it'll be more efficient in ORAM, right? Um, so oh. it'll be more efficient in ORAM. Just because, like, I mean, it does leak more than an ORAM. Um, but it's also more secure than a write-only ORAM. Does that make sense? Because it is also secure against a persistent adversary. And we do show in the paper that it implies history independence, and it does imply write-only obliviousness. So that's the relationship between the previous work. Okay, so this is very relevant to some of the Okay, moving on to the next speaker. Thanks for the great discussions. Um, the next speaker will be talking about the Stealth GB system. Yeah, good evening everyone. This is Dinakaran and this work is on Encrypt database system, supports There's no there's there's no speaker here, so the speaker just has to speak up. The microphone is only for the live stream, in case you're wondering. But yeah, if you could speak a little bit. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, work on Encrypt database system with full SQL support. That is one of the main motivations of the work. And this is joint work with Alexey Gribau and this work during, done during my PhD with my PhD advisor Sergey Garbunov at University of Waterloo. And I'll just briefly go again with a similar motivation that Gauss talked about uh, while emphasizing on the setting that we're working with. Yeah, our data gets collected by different entities like banks, hospitals, network providers, and any web application that we use. And typically, there is a DB admin who sets the access policies on the data that we are using. And also, say, at this credentials, or provides credentials to different clients. And clients, I mean, both the end users who access their own data that they store in the database, and also typically like some employees in the organization who per can perform some queries on the data that their company has collected. And, right. and also, this database is either maintained locally or moved to a cloud provider for typical access. And it's very common that, I mean, there are many kinds of attacks that we have seen over the years, each for like different reasons. 
and the source of the reason is different, but typically, like we are working in a setting where, I mean, this work is about a setting where the access policies we assume are uh, like done correctly, and it's about enforcing them. In, and also, we are assuming that, uh, like, the we are not talking about the leakage due to the data that's being collected by the query. So if someone is allowed to query something, uh, we are not talking about the implicit data that can be inferred from the queries. We are just trying to protect against like attacks, like say if someone can dump the memory or so typically like the snapshot attacks that you're talking about, but against someone who is not allowed to make those queries. Okay. So we want an encryption database, encrypt database system, which ideally has the security and performance. So security, we want the leakage profile to be as low as possible, and the performance, ideally, you should match the underlying database system, which operates on the plain text. So we want the efficiency comparable to the underlying plain text database system. And the main focus will be on ensuring the functionality to be complete. So we want to support all kinds of SQL queries, and also the DBMS functionalities. By that, what I mean is a DBMS functionality, like it performs many things in the background, like query planning, parsing, like data uh, backup, restore, and all kinds of things to ensure that uh, the safety of the data and also that the, to maintain the efficiency of a large scale database system. So our work focuses on ensuring also these functionalities in addition to supporting complete SQL support. And this, we like one of the things that we do is also maintain low intrusiveness to the database system. So the DB community is evolving while like developing mature database systems. So we want to ensure that we don't revamp the DBMS with a new construction. In this work, we try to aim for like minimal reduction to the underlying database system while providing security. In this setting, there are like two famous works. One is I mean, uh, popular works. One is the work of CryptDB, which uses property-preserving encryption to support the queries that are enabled by property-preserving encryption. And the rest of the subset of uh, queries will be transferred to a trusted proxy who will decrypt the data, perform the, uh, the, give the, get the result back to the server. And another work is by Cypherbase from Microsoft Research, which uses FPGA as a secure hardware to perform uh, to decrypt the data and perform the queries over the data and encrypt the results and send it back. The problems with these is that in CryptDB, while using property preserving encryption, there have been a lot of attacks uh, shown which say that if we have auxiliary information about the data, it's like completely broken even for snapshot attacks. And the problem with using FPGA in Cypherbase as this is that in typically in all cloud providing environments, to ensure the safety of the device to ensure that none of the operations that are performed by a remote client damages the device, all these current cloud providers use a monitoring program on the FPGA, which means effectively means that the system administrator can potentially get access to all the data that's being performed, uh, computation performed inside an FPGA. So this work, we focus on obtaining an encrypted database system which supports the confidentiality of data end to end for the model of snapshot attacks against weaker adversaries. And we also aim to provide, as I mentioned earlier, a complete SQL database support with low intrusion to the underlying database system. And we believe that this is more graceful degradation, of, even for stronger attacks like a persistent attacks with passive adversaries. We believe that this is more graceful degradation of security compared to the prior work which supports the entire SQL queries. Okay, and we built a prototype on top of Postgres. So this work, to achieve all this, we use Intel Software Guard extensions, and this design with its own limitations in mind. So to give a brief recap of what SGX does, typically when a co computation is performed in memory of system, just doing a mem uh, things are like unencrypted in memory, and just doing a memory dump will reveal all the data that's, I mean, data that's being computed on. And it's not, uh, and also like a concurrently running malicious program or like a privileged system code like operating system can, re like if they want, they can uh, learn any program that's being done. So the goal of Intel SGX is to encrypt the data or encrypt uh, parts of the memory such that the memory page gets decrypted only when it's moved to the CPU for computation. 
So if you trust the hardware, uh, the only information that even the privilege system code can learn from uh, the program that's running inside is that the data that goes as input to the, they call it enclave, the pro data that goes as input, the data that comes as output, and the code that's running inside the enclave when it's inserted, but nothing about the intermediate state of the computation that's running inside the enclave. So this is the security property that Intel SGX provides. And the second property that it provides is that I told that there is an untrusted part of uh, the program. Sorry. It's the untrusted part which loads the code inside an enclave. So a remote, or a remote user can ask the SGX hardware to produce a signed of the hash of the code that's running inside the enclave. So this is to ensure that the code that's running inside the enclave is actually what the remote user wants to run inside. So yeah, like one trivial naive solution that we could think of potentially as a first thought is why don't we run the entire database management system inside an enclave? Because it provides the confidentiality properties that we want, like why not? But the problem is that the trusted memory size is limited to 120 megabytes as of now. That's the size of the memory that you can keep encrypted at a time. And uh, there, it's not just like some initial trial. It's, it has some inherent bottlenecks uh, due to which Intel is not being able to scale. And also, the, the program that's running inside does not have support for I.O. And these are, like due to the, these are the performance systems level constraints. And also, even the current implementation with just 128 MB and lack of I.O. is subject to like different attacks, like access pattern leakages and other kinds of attacks. So we, we have to like be careful in the uh, like while des while designing the code that we run inside the enclave to ensure that it's not subject to these attacks. But if we're not careful, then these attacks will come into. Play. So the second thing that we thought about is say why don't we just run the query execution inside an enclave while the other parts of it are outside. But just doing a mi simple mini benchmarking by Say, decide just uh, reading a binary tree into an enclave and performing the deserialization and, say, trying to access a leaf. We realized that even for like half GB of data, we had overheads of up to 10x or 9x compared to just doing it in plain text outside an enclave. So we resorted to the cipher based design, sort of, where we only run primitive operations, what we call as primitive operations, inside an enclave. And the rest of the things are done by the untrusted DBMS outside. So what does this mean? Or okay, first, what does primitive operators mean? Is it's if you if a query parser, the, if you let's look at the output of the query parser, it's the operations that are done on the lowest level of the tree parse tree. So for example, if you consider this query where if you uh, if you want to compute the sum of balances of all customers whose city is Waterloo. The primitive operations here, there are two primitive operations here. First is the sum <coughs> operation, the addition operation that's been performed. And the second is the comparison, string matching comparison that's been performed. These are what I call the primitive operations. So having this in mind, how we would set up this system, the first step, uh, we have the encrypted version of the database stored in, like initially stored in this, where the database is encrypted tuple-wise. So each entry of the database is encrypted using semantic secure encryption, like AES, and the data is stored in disk. And we define encrypted data types and operators over to support operator operations on this uh, encrypted data. So for every plain text data type that's supported by the underlying database system, we define a corresponding encrypted data type. And in Postgres, these are defined as extensions uh, yeah, so as Postgres extensions. So for example, this for encrypted, uh, for, sorry, integer, we define encrypted integer. And for every operator that's, like so, uh, every operator which operates on this plain text data type, we overload this operator with, uh, to work with the encrypted data type, okay? And these are also in Postgres, they're defined as extensions to Postgres. And for instance, here, for the equal to operator, we define this procedure which calls the equal to operation running inside the enclave. This is, if we have the encrypted data types, uh, the procedure calls an enclave code which decrypts the data 
and performs the corresponding computation in equality or comparison. It just performs the uh, thing in plain text inside an enclave on the decrypted data. And depending on the policy of that query, it either decides to either encrypt the data or send it back. So for instance, if you are doing a plus operation over the encrypted integers, it would decrypt the two integers and check, perform the operation and encrypt the result and give it out. And for comparison operations, we in this uh, current setup, we are not encrypting the result. We're just revealing whether the comparison operation is, I mean, the result of the comparison, whether it's less than or greater. So, and the advantage of this kind of thing is that this also lets us to uh, perform operation between an encrypted data type and a plain text data type, and then decide whether the final result should be encrypted or not. So. The first step while running a DB, or like when setting it up, is we have three enclaves. And the first one, I mean, they are just logically separated. They could potentially, we can just have all of them in a single enclave. Uh, so the first one is an authorization enclave, which is supposed to perform two tasks. But the first thing that the database admin decides, it for, performs an attestation of this author enclave to check whether the correct code has been loaded, and then gives the credential database to it. And while running the system, this author Clave will act as, or the enclaves together will act as a single, uh, like a client, which could potentially access all the items in the database. So the other enclave, what are the two things that it's supposed to do? The first thing, it, it, uh, yeah, it can authorize, like uh, when a client tries to log in, it has access to the credential DB, it will check the access policies of the client, and then if the access policies match, uh, or okay, if it, it uh, checks the credentials of the client and establishes a session with the client. And also, author enclave, the second thing it does, it creates two other enclaves called the query preprocessor enclave and the obs enclave. I'll tell what the, this preprocessor enclave does. The obs enclave, what it does, it's, it has the code for all the uh, encrypted operators that are defined in the previous slides. So what a preprocessor enclave does, we'll see when the client wants to execute some query in this database, it encrypts the query using uh, the session key. And the preprocessor enclave does two things. It first checks whether the client has the access policies allow the client to execute this query, number one. Number two, what it does is it, can, it parses the query and encrypts the data values in that query using the semantic secure encryption. So this is the second, the query parsing is the second thing that the, uh, and, and encrypting data values is the thing that the preprocessing enclave does. And now this uh, converted query is sent to the DBMS engine. So the DBMS engine, sees the, the structure of the queries the DBMS engine sees are the same. It's just that the, play, the plain text data values are all encrypted uh, using semantic secure encryption. And the DBMS engine now performs this query. And when it reaches an operand where, where uh, the one of the, or it reaches an operator where one of the operands is an encrypted data type, it will contact the ops enclave, uh, I mean, uh, automatically. And like where it sends the results of the, the encrypted operand, and the DBMS, it's a, we work with an unmodified DBMS because we overload the operands and the overloaded operation that's done inside the enclave. And one other change that we do is like while reading or writing from disk, we also encrypt the data that goes, the data pages or yeah, the pages. Does the offset claim uh, trust this external query that comes to it? Uh, Okay, option, so okay, since we are not doing, we are just doing snapshot adversaries, right? we are just not protecting against active adversaries. So ops enclave can potentially be used as an oracle to perform any operation. That you want. So for, to start with, for a memory snapshot attack, where, uh, yeah, so the memory snapshot attack during the initialization phase when there's no query being performed, it leaks the encrypted database and all the auxiliary data structures that are present. So we leak the shape of the database because we encrypt the data tuple-wise. We reveal the database schema, the number of columns, and also shape of indexes. So the index is created, for example, if it's a B3 index, it reveals the number of keys. It doesn't reveal which one is which, but it reveals the number in each of the auxiliary data structures. And during the query phase, in addition to, for a snapshot attack, in, ad attack, in addition to the shape of the database, we also reveal, and the underlying database will maintain some logs, which, in our case, the interesting part is the comparison results that are revealed by the Upson clay. And these logs, which are not checkpointed, written to disk, these 
which stay in memory, these are also revealed during a memory snapshot, I mean, a whole overall snapshot attack. The disk is encrypted so that. And so this by itself is like better than like cryptdb, but that's a low bar. Uh, the second one is a persistent attack where, yeah, in addition to revealing the shape of the database, we all, uh, okay, we reveal the modifying sh shapes as they modify over time for that, for long, as long as attack persists. And in addition, we also reveal, as you would expect, the logs that are uh, collected over time that the attack persists. And this, we think it's like a reasonable uh, thing to expect. And in the worst case, it, uh, it reduces security, reduces to using ORE if the attack persists for like a very long time. So we implemented this over, uh, yeah, we benchmarked the system using the, uh, the traditional TPCC benchmarking, which to be done for like all the database community, which for transactional queries that would be performed. And like f as far as we know, this is the only like ours the first system which provides like a benchmarking uh, which supports complete DPCC benchmarking. The previous uh, papers that we have, when we looked at in detail, they skipped one query or the other when they did the benchmarking. And uh, for like TPCC scale factor, you can think of it as concurrent clients that are querying the database. And in our work for like concurrent 16 clients, we get like a throughput reduction of about 30% over the plain text database. And with a latency about like one millisecond uh, like in the median case. Yeah, and this concludes my talk. Like we have encrypted database system. We focus on supporting complete SQL queries and all the underlying DBMS operations. That was the goal to start with. And uh, yeah, for this system, we get a 30% throughput decrease when 16 uh, yeah, concurrent operations are done over like a 7 GB encrypted database. And we get a latency of one millisecond. The code is open source for you guys to try out. And like we took a, like a conservative approach of modifying uh, or like starting with an encrypted database and then performing modifications over it. Potentially, there could be like a very strong research direction of working with the DB community to ensure like we can incorporate more advanced like cryptographic constructions while supporting all the DBMS operations. But if we continue to operate in this model, then it's also not clear how we would like provide integrity without changing drastically integrity of the query responses without changing drastically the underlying DBMS. And also, like, like recently it has been shown that just having the shape of the query responses, we can reconstruct, or, or for like, with some assumptions, just providing the shape of the query responses, we can reconstruct uh, underlying data. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, for each of these things, it will be interesting to see whether with minimal modification of the underlying database, we can thwart these attacks. And that's it, thanks. Okay, we have one minute for questions. Hey, um, thank you for presentation. Actually, I have a question related to Enclave DB. Mm -hmm. um, what is the key or if our uh, key differences between your work and Enclave DB? So Enclave DB is designed for in-memory database system. And they assume that they will be at some point be an enclave which can support 100 GBs of uh, encrypted memory space, or at least to have the whole encry uh, encrypted database that's present inside an enclave. And the whole work was done with a simulator. So it's like not. I mean, the design is good, and they also maintain, uh, they also provide uh, uh, freshness of data if you have such a big enclave space. But uh, the way that I view it, it, it cannot be implemented on a current, like SGX, or like the current set of trusted execution environments that we have at this point. Maybe at some point in the future, like, we'll have such. Oh, yeah. Actually, could the next speaker set up while we're taking this question? Right. Um, the second question is, how hard would it be if you want to implement the same solution but for NoSQL database? Okay, so, oops, just give me some. 
So for NoSQL, I mean, do you have some? I think it would depend on the concrete database system. So for Postgres, it was easy because it allowed extensions. MySQL, it would have required a little more work to do that. So it's about how uh, easy for the underlying database system, how easy it's to define new data types and like perform you operations over it. That's, that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> So, just a question. You mentioned a slowdown of thirty percent. Um, is this dependent on the query type? Did you experience something slower with like deep joins or something like this, or is it independent? So, yeah, it, it does depend on the query type, right. uh, and also, like, I mean, the encrypted data, but uh, memory space we have is just one twenty megabytes, right? So, just the transition into and outside the enclave was like a big overhead, mm -hmm. and so for like. If the query requires more things to be go inside and outside the enclave, then that will incur a bigger slowdown than. But joins we do outside, right? So our comparisons, so we assume that index is formed. So index formation will take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But once you have that, I think uh, joins probably will just have it outside the enclave. We won't use it inside the enclave. I see. OK, thanks. OK, we'll be moving on to the next speaker. Uh, while they transfer the microphone, and this time I'm going to remember. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, I'm going to present my work on encrypted databases for differential privacy. This is a joint work with Maurice Hurley, he, Seni Kamara, and Tariq Mautas. So uh, one of the big advantages of uh, big data is that you can do statistical analysis on them for improving, let's say, health, agriculture, or uh, customer experience. But the downside is that it, has, uh, uh, it can have some privacy implications as well. And a state of the uh, art is to use differential privacy uh, uh, in these scenarios. Uh, and many companies actually use differential privacy uh, uh, for collecting uh, 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 statistics on their users' data. So in the traditional model of differential privacy, we have a trusted curator, which is actually storing your data. And then we have an analyst uh, uh, that sends the query to the trusted curator, which then computes the query, uh, adds some noise to the result and then sends the answer back to the analyst. But then uh, as the data gets bigger and bigger, it gets harder to secure as well. And this is exactly the point of this work, is that how do we secure the databases that is actually stored with now the trusted curator? So now we look at a slightly different model where let's say the data is no longer stored with the trusted curator, but is now stored at some storage platform. For example, let's say cloud. And then you want your trusted curator to be still uh, able to operate on that data. right? And then we also consider a third kind of an adversary, which we call as a snapshot adversary, which comes uh, uh, and takes a snapshot of your data that is stored here, and then just goes. So in the literature, there is a notion of pan privacy in which instead of storing the data, you store a pan-private database, which is basically a no noise mixed in with the database. Um, and then uh, uh, it attempts to solve some of these issues, but it has some limitations. The first limitation is that the answer that is returned to curator's queries will be lossy. Another disadvantage is that you can only guarantee differential privacy against this persistent adversary. And maybe you want to do better against these adversaries. And the last disadvantage is that uh, the utility uh, uh, of the uh, answers that are returned to the analyst, they the utility decreases as more and more uh, breaches happen over time. So then the question is that can we do better? Can we replace the, let's say, pan-private databases with, let's say, encrypted databases and overcome these limitations? So in, in this work, we answer this question, which is that can we design encrypted databases that support differentially private statistical queries? So in our work, we model encrypted databases as structured encryption schemes or STE schemes. These are well-studied in literature. And 
we model encrypted databases that support differentially private queries uh, as uh, private STE schemes. And this is what we study in this work. OK. And this is going to be the outline of my talk. Um, I'll start with defining what STE schemes are. Then I'll define what PSTE schemes or private STE schemes are. Then as a concrete example, we'll see, we'll see a construction uh, of a PSTE scheme that supports histogram queries. And in the end, I'll give efficiency estimates of our construction. OK, so let's just start with seeing what an STE scheme really is. So um, it just a set, uh, STE scheme is a set of three protocols, which is run between uh, a client and a server. OK, yeah. So uh, the first protocol is a setup protocol that is, uh, that is executed by the client. It takes in a data structure and outputs an encrypted data structure and a key. The client then forwards the encrypted data structure to the cloud, and the cloud then stores the encrypted data structure. Then uh, when a client wants to query this encrypted data structure, it can run the query protocol where it puts in its key, the query, while the server puts in its encrypted data structure. And as a result, the client receives an answer to its query queue. The third protocol is an update protocol, uh, which, uh, which uh, uh, in which the client puts its key and its update, while the cloud puts in its encrypted data structure. And as an output, update uh, 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 returns an encrypted, uh, a new encrypted data structure, uh, which is encrypted data, EDS prime, and then the cloud updates uh, its own encrypted data structure. So at, at a very high level, we say that an encrypted, uh, that an STE scheme is secure if these protocols, they reveal nothing about the data structure and the operands beyond the leakages, which are, which are defined by these functions over here, LS, LQ, and LU. Uh, Goss actually talked about it uh, in detail. So uh, this is just like a very high level idea. So now we know what an STE scheme is. So now we'll go ahead and uh, 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 see what a PSTE scheme is. So a PSTE scheme is a set of five protocols. It's, uh, the protocols are executed between uh, a curator, server, and an analyst. Uh, uh, the first is setup. It is also executed between uh, these three parties. And at the end of which, the server uh, receives a private encrypted database, PEDB, and the curator and the analyst, they both receive a key. The next three protocols, E add, E remove, or E query, or you can think about it as encrypted add, encrypted remove, or encrypted query. It's run between, uh, sorry, it's run between the curator and the server. And if uh, uh, if it's an E query protocol, the curator gets an answer back. Whereas if it's an update, like an add or a remove, then this uh, PEDB gets updated. The last one is a P query or a private query protocol, which is run uh, between a server and an analyst. Uh, so analyst sends its query, and the server responds with an answer back. So for correctness, we want that this E query protocol should return the correct response back to the curator. And by correct response, we mean that it should be correct and it should not be a noisy response. If you remember, one of the disadvantage of pan privacy was that curator was getting a noisy response. So we want that this result should be correct. And then we want, uh, 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 as correctness property from pQuery, that the result that's returned to the analyst should not be too far away from its true value with high probability. OK. So uh, if you remember, we uh, there are different uh, kinds of adversaries uh, that we consider in our model. So there are different kinds of security definitions or security properties that we want against all these kinds of adversaries. So let's look at the security guarantees that we need. Against the server, we need a persistent security. Uh, Goss actually talked about it, so again, at a very high level. Um, so uh, the persistent security is an extension of the STE security definitions that we saw earlier. And uh, in addition, um, we, we want that even the P-query protocol should not reveal 
anything about the data structure uh, uh, to the analyst beyond, beyond the leakage, which is denoted by uh, LP over here. Against the snapshot adversary, we require a snapshot security. What that means is that when the, when the snapshot adversary gets this PEDV, this PEDB should not reveal to the adversary anything about the underlying uh, database and the sequence of operations that led to that database uh, uh, beyond the snapshot leakage, which is denoted by LSN over here. And uh, in the end, we have the, our third adversary, which is the analyst. And against analyst, we want uh, differential privacy. What this says is that if you are given two neighboring update operation sequences, then looking at the outputs of the P queries, P queries, the analyst should not be able to tell whether the first update operation sequence happened or the second happened with high probability. OK. Uh, so now that we have defined what a PSTE scheme is or what an object looks like, so now we'll go ahead and uh, uh, look at our construction, which supports uh, histogram queries. We call the construction HPX. Uh, but uh, to build uh, uh, this construction, we need another PSTE scheme for encrypted private counters. We call it CPX. So I'll give a high level idea of this, and then we'll build that. OK, so let's see what a CPX is. So as I mentioned before, uh, uh, CPX is a PST scheme for building encrypted uh, private counters. And it supports three protocols, setup, eAd, and pread. eAd takes in a value A, which is the value that you want to add to your counter. And A can be 1, negative 1, or a 0. 1 is representing an increment to the counter, negative 1, a decrement, whereas 0 is a no op to the counter. Then uh, p read, it simply returns the counter value. Uh, and we want that this counter value should be differentially private. So to build this encrypted private counter as a building block, we use the binary mechanism from Chan et al. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm not going to describe this due to the lack of time. But the thing to remember is that this binary mechanism, it implements a private counter. Uh, remember, uh, what we want is an encrypted private counter. And a binary mechanism, it gives us a private counter. And it uses a range tree to implement this binary counter, uh, sorry, private counter. OK. So now that we have a private counter, how do we convert it to an encrypted private counter? So what we do is that we use uh, additive homomorphic encryption and encrypt all the nodes of the range tree. and then. If a value needs to be added to any of these nodes, we simply use, uh, 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 we add that value homomorphically. So that gives us an encrypted uh, private counter. Now let's quickly look at the security properties that uh, uh, this encrypted private uh, counter gives us. So uh, against, uh, against the server, uh, uh, so during an add operation, what the server sees is an encryption of this value A that you want to add to the counter, and this, this encrypted counter here itself. So looking at these things, the server simply learns that an add happened. That's it. Nothing else. It doesn't learn what A is or anything else. So against the snapshot adversary, the snapshot is simply this, this encrypted counter, looking at which the snapshot adversary basically learns nothing. And against the analyst, differential privacy is guaranteed because uh, 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 the binary mechanism uh, ensures that this counter is differentially private. So it just follows from there. OK. So now that we have our building block ready, we, we, we'll go ahead and see how we can construct a PST scheme for histogram queries. So just to give a high level idea of what histogram queries are, it's just like counting queries. Uh, which count the number of elements that satisfy a certain property. So you can imagine that you want to count the number of people in, the date, uh, in, in your database that are between ages, let's say, 10 to 20, 20 to 40, or anything, right? OK, so as I already mentioned, that as, building blocks, uh, as a building block, we'll use CPX. But along with that, we'll also use a dynamic 
STE scheme for databases. So STE subscripted with DB really means an STE scheme for DB. But from now on, whenever I say STE, just, just think about it as like STE scheme for database. OK. So we have our three prior parties, curator, server, uh, and an analyst. So the server, uh, as a PEDB, maintains two things, uh, an encrypted database and encounters. Uh, where you have one counter uh, uh, representing one bucket in a histogram. Then EDB is set up using STE.setup, whereas the counters are set up using CPX.setup. Then when, uh, when the curator uh, initiates an e-add or an e-remove uh, uh, protocol, uh, server first updates the EDB over here using STE.update. And then it updates the counters using cpx.update. So for example, suppose the curator adds an age 20 to the database. And let's say that 20 corresponds to the second bucket of the uh, histogram. So you want to basically increment this counter by one, right? So you add 1 to this counter using cpx.eAd, whereas you add 0 to all the other counters, because you don't want to increment them. OK, then when uh, the curator uh, increments eQuery, the server simply uh, uses ste.query on EDB, computes the answer back, and sends it back to the curator. For pQuery, uh, uh, when the analyst sends a pQuery to the server, it uh, uses cpx.pread on the counter that is uh, uh, given as a parameter by the analyst to the server. So, it, uh, the server just reads uh, the counter corresponding to this bucket ID using cpx.pread and sends the answer back. OK, so now we know uh, what the construction looks like. Uh, let's see uh, what the security, uh, what kind of security is provided by this HPX. OK, so uh, uh, one thing I like to mention here is that uh, I'll give here a very high level idea of how the proof goes. But we have formal proofs of security in our paper. And if you want to look at them, please see our paper. So uh, the first adversary, let's uh, look at uh, the server. And these are all the interactions that ha ever happen uh, with the server. And let's look at them one by one. So uh, during an update, uh, the first thing the server did was update this EDB using STE.update, right? So at which point the server actually learns the update leakage of the STE. And then it also learns the EAD leakage of the counters. But if you remember, the EAD uh, leakage was just that an add happened. So that really means nothing. And also because all the counters are updated, the server never gets to know which counter you really updated. OK. Then during an e-query, again, the EDB was queried by the server using STE.query, right? So at that point, uh, uh, the server learns the query leakage uh, uh, of STE on this EDB. In the end, we have a pQuery. The leakage is just this, P, uh, this bucket ID that is learned by the server, because the cpx.pread had no uh, leakage. OK, so this, is, this was the security against the persistent adversary. Against the analyst, differential privacy simply follows uh, from the differential privacy guarantees of the CPX. In the end, we have snapshot adversary. Uh, uh, so against this, ad this kind of adversary, uh, uh, so you have snapshot leakage from EDB and you have snapshot leakage from CPX. But then we saw that snapshot leakage of CPX uh, was nothing. So snapshot leakage of our PSTE scheme or HPX is simply equal to the snapshot leakage of EDB. Okay. Uh, that was the end of our construction and the security uh, proofs, or informal security proofs. So uh, let's see how it does in practice. So uh, uh, if you remember, the time it takes to add a value to an HPX is equal to time it takes to add the value, add the value V to the database and time it takes to update encounters, right? Because you were adding to the encounters. Similarly, the remove is same as add. 
query uh, time it takes to query our HPX is equal to time it takes to query our database because that's all we did. And for P query, it's equal to the time it takes to read one of the counters. So uh, 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 we use Payer with 2048 uh, bit key as our additive homomorphic encryption scheme. Uh, we used uh, uh, the DLS scheme uh, from Amjad, uh, the goose just described this protocol, uh, as our STE scheme. And in this scheme, uh, database is actually represented as a multi-map. The maximum number of operations uh, were set to 2 to the 32. Uh, the number of bins that we considered was 25, and the multi-map size was uh, 10 million pairs. And these were the estimates that we got. Uh, 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 add and remove, they both took uh, 0.94 milliseconds, uh, while query uh, took one microsecond, and P query uh, took 21 milliseconds. And these are like pretty reasonable numbers on uh, this sized multi-map. So in the end, I'll uh, talk about some of the collusions uh, uh, that we talk about in our paper. So we considered the case where the snapshot adversary uh, or the persistent adversary can collude with the analyst now. Uh, and to deal with such collusions, we use a stronger uh, STE schemes. Please read our paper to see how it uh, works. And uh, with that, I'll say thank you and we can take some questions. We are out of time, but I think in fairness, we should take at least one question if one exists. How did you choose your security parameters for the PDA encryption scheme? I'm, I'm sorry, I can. How did you choose your uh, security parameters for the PDA encryption scheme? Oh, for the PIER? For you had 2048 bits. I was just wondering how did you choose the rest I think of the that's security? like a pretty standard. Uh, 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 key length that's used, so we just decided to use that. Okay, I thought there were more parameters involved in the scheme. Oh. Uh, okay, late. that's fine. Okay. Okay, I think I'm going to cut it off here. We're already 13 minutes over our scheduled time anyway, but thanks to all of our speakers, and you can certainly talk to them after the session. Thanks for everybody for coming.